This one. Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody again to another uh, community uh, weekly update on the 15th of February. So, uh, I think to start off today, we'll, uh, same agenda, we'll do some demo items. Uh, uh, because we have an upcoming release, we'll talk quickly about the state of that release. Um, and then I think there were some uh, items maybe that were uh, brought up in the community Slack, some open discussion we had that was going to be pretty interesting. So we'll do kind of a, uh, save some time at the end to do open floor and, uh, and and if there are any uh, open questions about those kind of conversations or topics, like uh, we can we can cover those. Um, and to start off, though, I think we have uh, Mr. Lewis who uh, who has a, a demo that he wanted to uh, present. So we'll turn it over to you, Lewis. Yeah, well, I have a little demo about uh, Macy Gen. We have added um, package source file support. So if you want, I can share my screen. One moment, share screen. Um, this one. Now you should be able to see Meitsu Gen, right? Yeah. So a little uh, introduction. I'm Lewis. Um, I work at Xperius here in the Netherlands. And we acknowledged in Magento 1 that we always wanted to generate uh, modules because else you're writing the same code over and over again. So Mates Gen was born in 2016 and uh, currently still developing on it. <coughs> and one cool feature that we added is uh, source package file support for 2.3 because of um, PVA Studio. So if you switch to 2.3, you will be have uh, the opportunity to use save and download package files. Um, uh, there are two points you can already use two snippets, that is components and GraphQL. Um, for, for example, um, for a product image carousel in PVAW, um, we have to add a custom component like a carousel. Um, you can select a style type uh, as CSS or CSS. The reason I have added that is that uh, Jordan is working with as CSS, my colleague, um, but in the default it's always CSS. So um, then it generates the folder structure. Um, I have added in this case, also a vendor um, and module structure, actually kind of like um, Magento module structure. So you have also a vendor opportunity within your components. I know that's currently not the um, the way components are added to the to the team, but. I think that if you're going to install third party components, you need to have like a reference of the vendor. Um, but that's just my opinion. Um, so it generates the code for you. What does it? It um, adds the default classes, which you need with the CSS files, and of course the basic index file. Um, this one can be downloaded separately from the module because if you have also a Magento module related to this um, to this component, you want to download it to your Magento installation to your app code. But in this case, you want to edit the package files for uh, for your Venia concept, and then you almost have like the same download functionality. The difference is that. There is a type specified, so it uh, makes a difference between the module and the package files, um, which is also supported as the GraphQL endpoint. Um, I've already demonstrated that uh, earlier, the Magento part in the GraphQL meeting, but um, now it also adds um, an example query you can implement within your uh, Venia concept. So in the queries, it already sets an example query for you. 
with the given input you've put in the parameters. Um, a question from Jane Satlin came forward is that, okay, that's cool, but um, what if you have front-enders who only develop uh, for PVA? Then you need, um, you need to give them like a console command, which is used for NPM. Um, Mace Gen already gives the opportunity to do it through the command line, but that is, uh, the, is, is written in Python and you have to install some packages uh, so you can eventually use it. So what I've been working on, but I'm also having a meeting next week, uh, I think next week with uh, James himself and some of his colleagues, is the following. If I switch screen now, one second. How do I do this? <laughs> Okay, um, look, can you see both images <coughs> in the shell, or you see yeah. just one? Just one. Would you see one? We see the command line. <coughs> yeah, so what I've done is um, created mage to node which is actually the same as uh, mage to gen only it is based on the API. So I have added uh, an API local on my local environment from which you can um, um, give the same parameters as the interface, only you're already within your installation. And then you can, um, then you get an identifier back from which you can download. But of course, maybe in the future it's like, um, it's already directly, um, how do you say it? installing it within your uh, PVA, but that is something uh, that is work in progress. This is just proof of concept and we'll be later talking about that with James Zetlin. This is the other screenshot where you see, okay, these are the snippets which are already available from which you can currently only use two for PVA. But that's it um, shortly. Are there any questions? Uh, it's cool being a new person on the team. I didn't even know that this tool existed, so that's uh, that's pretty cool. This is James, um, I'm sorry. I'm troubleshooting some deployment stuff, so I need all the internet I can get, and my videos off. But <laughs> Lewis, this is fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, for waiting on me and thank you, Lewis. We did speak about this. Um, I was at Adobe Tech Summit at the time and we haven't set up that meeting, but but I will today. Okay. Um, so just for context, for those of you who haven't done uh, Magento modular extension development, Mage2Gen is a really popular, really beloved tool. And it's a scaffolding generator with the graphical user interface you saw. And what Lewis and I discussed was that since part of the um, philosophy of PWA Studio is to um, enable you to do developments just in your area of expertise and in your area of interest, um, we wanted to see if the sort of stuff specific to the PWA Studio ecosystem could work independently. And I just tossed it out as a suggestion, like, hey, what if this was a node generator and you could use it through NPM and then Mage2Gen connected to that? And that was what, like, Six days ago? Anyway, Lewis did it. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is, really... this is this is this is great work. Yeah, I mean, I, I know Jordan's been helping out quite a bit as well and had some some really good ideas around configuration and setup. But that, yeah, for those who use it, you know, don't be uh, don't be afraid to, uh, to to send a coffee Lewis's way. This is a you know passion project of his, and yeah, I mean, James has been talking about scaffolding and setup for a long time uh, for this, and so it's, this is exactly. You know, again, the type of outcomes that we're looking for here. So nice work. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks, Lewis. All right. So next up, open call. I didn't see anybody else kind of chatter about uh, wanting to do a demo. So give anybody on the line an opportunity to uh, step in if they have anything. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next item.
I have I've dropped a message in chat for I don't know if Cooper or Bar Green's on the line, but the cart item options could be a good one to show. What say you, Bar Green? <laughs> well, I don't have a uh, a demo prepared or anything, um, okay. but I guess I could use the the now deployment, right? Well, that's funny you should say that. Uh, well, maybe we'll wait until uh, the next meeting. Yeah. All so, right. so you you probably no, you probably can. The one that's aliased to veniapwa.com is still mid deploy. Kind of uh, troubleshooting why the the last one didn't uh, work, but you can deploy it if you have an open pull request, or even if you have a closed pull request, and you can fetch that individual deployment URL. That'll probably work. Yep. Okay. Do you think that's better left for the next one? Uh, we can hold off. If you don't, if you don't have a demo prepared, let's just hold off for the next for the next meeting. Then. Yeah, I mean, such as Blame Andy. Uh, <laughs> it was really good work. <laughs> also, it's very peak. It's very peak JavaScript that your conference room is named undefined. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that what is? I think so. <laughs> So uh, quickly then, we'll talk about uh, the upcoming release. Uh, share my screen. We're here to start sharing screen. So on our board, you can see the items that are up, currently up. Uh, so uh, we had we had plans of, of uh, delivering a release yesterday. Uh, there were a few items that we wanted to get across the line. Uh, on the board, you can see those items that are still in progress and that are still in the review and QA column that are tagged for 2.0 release. Uh, pending moving those items across the board, we're, we're targeting early next week to get the release out. Uh, I don't know if, James, you have anything else to say on, to speak to with the release, but uh, in terms of the details of it or um, preview of it, but that is kind of the state that we're in for 2.0 release. <laughs> well, I can certainly say that I uh worked super hard we all worked super hard yesterday to to try and get a release going um that day but we have a quality standard so i i spent uh i was pretty bummed that we didn't have just those final bits slotted in i feel like um the early next week deadline uh will allow us to have a system that not only gives you all of the good UX in the base scenarios that we've all been working towards. Just little stuff that everyone's contributing, being uh, smoothly and quickly folded in over the last couple of weeks has improved that already dramatically. Um, but it should also give uh, those users who aren't on Macs, who are running in virtual machines, who are running in Linux environments, a smoother installation and dev experience, kind of the last item on the list um the nature of the release we also have been discussing this i think is still somewhat unclear because this is magento and a magento and magento is chiefly great at making the magento product whose releases are you know fanfares um this product is uh i think that the way you can think of this is that this release is our private guarantee to the developer community that we're going to begin following semantic versioning with our changes. And that means specifically that once 2.0.0 comes out, that that means that any additional API changes, if they're additive, will result in 2.1.0. If they're breaking, it will be 3.0.0. So our major versioning, we're not sentimental about it. We make ma breaking changes, uh, so that you can keep doing cool new things, that will mean PWA Studio 4 and 5 and 6 in short order. Um, and so we are um, still working on a plan or on a, a sort of an agreement for what versions, major and minor, we will try to support or accept bug fixes for all at the same time. And so we, we still need to... Um, to get that completely settled, but this is a community project and we want sort of community input and understanding about it. Um, semantic versioning is on the one hand really clear and on the one hand can cause some confusion. So let me just say 
from the top of my head, as I've been thinking for for a while, that we all want to have PWA Studio 2.0.0. <clears throat> and the, as soon as that's out, we want to start working on two things at once. We want to begin working in one consolidated branch on the work that incorporates GraphQL additions from Magento 2.3.1. We would call that release three. And then we also want to do a fast follow to incorporate things that didn't make this release deadline, but that will add quality uh, and or fix known issues. And we would call that hotfix 2.0.1. And that means that we will be maintaining two deployable branches at that time at the same time. Does that make sense? I think we all know that at the very minimum that that's something that we're going to do. Um, what remains to me is, I, you know, I'm just opening this to the community floor, we want to do this transparently, is to understand at any point in the future um, how many uh, branches of code that could potentially be released will be operating at once. We know that at least there will be a major release, a hotfix release, and potentially a minor release. But if you look at other JavaScript projects, or projects that interact with the NPM ecosystem, like say React or Angular or Vue, um, major versions can be patched, but usually it's only the most recent major version that gets any active iteration. And we wanna make sure that people in the community are kind of prepared for the way that that will operate. So I wanna open the floor about that to, to any concerns or any questions about what the maintenance plans will be and what the release cadence will mean for your projects and your work. That is to say, I guess, what would people worry about with our release? What are people's first burning questions about the release, how it's gonna operate? I think if I were one of you guys, I would ask, how is the support between Magento 2.3 versions and PWA Studio versions going to work? There's a there's a good question. I can pretend one, one of you guys asked that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 the answer is fairly simple. If Magento introduces a breaking change in its APIs, then a version of PWA Studio and Venia, which supports or works with that breaking change, is also a breaking change. And so that means it's a major version. In Magento 2.3.1, there are a couple of small changes to the GraphQL schema, which are not purely additive. Yeah. An example that a lot of us have already experienced is in the uh, category specification, there is a small underscore image property that in the 2.3.0 schema is a string and that would be the url of the image yeah and due to some improvements in metadata the 2.3.1 and latest versions of magento master that graphql schema has changed so that small underscore image is now its own complex type it's an object with a string property for path and that's a breaking change in GraphQL because a, a query that's written to expect a string is going to cause a real error message, which is sometimes inconvenient feeling, but the more you get into these strong types, the more it's great to feel like, oh, it failed fast, it told me something was wrong, rather than just have your app start behaving in mysterious ways. So it's loud and it complains, but we like it. And a breaking change like that is, believe it or not, something that we would call a full major version. Just one name, one change, and that's just in order to be completely clear about support. <clears throat> so the version of PWA Studio whose GraphQL query includes an object for small image, that's 3.0. So as long as that's clear, and as long as there isn't any serious concern over that practice or that policy, um, then I think we're good to go. Does anyone have worries about that? I don't know that I have a worry as much as a question about uh, why that would it would only be a patch version for the GraphQL project, but a major version for us. 
Well, <laughs> it's um, that seems like it would be a breaking change for them too, and maybe they should even run yeah. this patch for their patch uh, portion. It's an older project. There is there is a joke in the community about Magento three. Yusei Ritsma makes T-shirts that say Magento three on them, um, <laughs> but the underlying fact is. Um, that Magento 2.3.x is um, what you call a marketing version, a lot like how Windows, like deep down, has its own like versions that are like nine and ten and eleven and twelve. Um, the Magento versions that are used for like semantic versioning are in the Composer JSON, and it's like a hundred something dot. Something. Uh, okay. So those okay. are the real Magento versions. Um, and when we actually declare or describe rules, um, we want to add, for instance, um, site info schema information so that when the project builds against a Magento instance, that it queries the Magento instance for that compatibility. It would be asking for that version. Gotcha, so gotcha. the choice to call it 2.3.1, even though there's breaking changes, that's more of a marketing choice, and it's a choice that reflects that it is a release which uh, enhances functionality or fixes gaps, but does not like add a banner feature necessarily. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. No problem. One question about versioning: Does it? Um, how do you say the main version of the module? which provides the GraphQL uh, endpoint, does that one go up or is that also like a bug fixing number, like the 2.3.1? Or is that going to be like uh, uh, 2.4.0? If I take a look at the module version number. Well, um, first of all, let me uh, say a big caveat that I am not, probably the biggest expert on the way that Magento modules and GraphQL extensions are versioned, even on this call. Um, but I can tell you that the way that our GraphQL system is set up, there is an underlying GraphQL module that provides the functionality. And then individual modules such as catalog and cart uh, use that new functionality to extend and describe additions to the GraphQL schema. So if there is a change across the board to the way GraphQL functions, like for instance, if it adds a, a feature or fixes a bug in the parsing of syntax, then that will be a revision of the GraphQL module itself, Magento GraphQL. But the change in the small image property, for instance, is a, is a version change in the catalog module. Yeah, understandable, thank you. So I got a question from Adrian in chat. Hi, Adrian. Thanks for being nice to me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> the, the, it's a good question, and thanks, Andrew, for pointing me to it. Um, community decisions about versioning are really important to us. And the question is, how will our versioning policy affect community contribution? Yeah. What will the workflow look like? Who decides on the version? And right now we're deciding on the versioning policy. I think we have a pretty sane beginning approach to it, but the versioning policy needs to be something we are all comfortable with. And it's important to us because we are kind of the, the first major consumers of some new Magento features like GraphQL. So we're gonna to have to be careful about this. Um, so the, uh, the policy and the process we all decide on, but my hope is that we would arrive at a system where the versioning is always clear, that it's very rare that you need to make a, a sort of a decision that might be disputed. With APIs, for instance, if a signature changes or a behavior changes or any sort of return type changes, it's breaking every time. And there's very little need for discussion unless you're me and I would argue about it pointlessly, but I try not to do that. Um, and then if, you know, if it's an additive change to schema that wouldn't break anything else that does duct typing, then that's a minor change. And if it's something that fixes functionality, but doesn't uh, change any types 
or uh, any guaranteed behaviors, then it's a patch. In the real world, sometimes that's hard, um, but ultimately, you know, the core maintainers would make a call if there's ever a serious problem. I just don't expect that there would be uh, a lot of argument. And if there is, then that indicates a problem. And in the case of a problem, we would listen to the community and talk about it. What else we got? More questions? Adrian says he's always nice on Twitter. All right, well, now I feel less special. Thank you. <laughs> All right, yeah, so uh, there are no further questions. I think the only item at the end was just, uh, James, if we want to follow up on any of the recent discussion uh, from the community Slack regarding uh, server-side rendering or uh, I think there was another discussion that happened between you and Jimmy, and uh, I don't have it in front of me right now, but uh, anything you want to speak to there, otherwise we will wrap it up. There are a couple of things we could discuss. I think it's probably uh, the discussion is significant enough that it ought to be recorded or textual, but we can call this out. Um, is Jimmy on the line? He's not. I'm looking right now. Okay. Well, um, the, let's let's do kind of two pieces of let's, there's there's two di uh, distinct subjects to discuss. One of them is about server side rendering, and we've been describing our approach to this for a while. It's not um, as clear and simple as just do React yeah. server side rendering. So it can be hard to describe. We're committed to restating it as much as we need to. Um, but our approach has always been that we don't want to lock anyone in from the largest merchant, or the, the most wealthy partner or SI down to the smallest, don't want to make them use a tech stack in addition to the Magento that they already know. So the, the SSR story was always uh, constrained by the fact that we we just don't want to demand that you run a Node.js server on your back end, period. Now, most probably the larger deployments and those deployments that use Docker and other architectures kind of um, yourselves, you probably will. Uh, it, it makes sense to run a back end for front end in Node. It's fairly fast. You wrap it in some caching, and then you can do good server side rendering. That doesn't fully answer the question of server-side rendering a an app that loads dynamically, but that's a different story. So yeah, it makes sense to run Node, but we worked very hard in the PWA Studio architecture to guarantee that the PWA can run even with without a Node backend. And the way that that's done is a PWA has to understand exactly what the server is supposed to do, and that's what the upward file is there for, for it to declare the behaviors of the origin server that it requires in order to run. You know, here's where my JavaScript needs to load from. Here's how images need to resolve. Here's where I expect GraphQL and REST endpoints to be. Um, and one of those rules is for a given page, is it, H, is it search.html or is it the root? Um, what HTML needs to render? And right now in its basic form, Upward uses mustache templates to do that, but it can use anything. If you look at the specification, Upward will let you declare um, or implement your server with another template engine. That's why there's a property name in the template resolver for engine. It's not just mustache, but mustache is the default. So you would write a new renderer, very simple API for the JavaScript client, just string and data in, string out. And then you would output React and then Upward doesn't really know or care how to do React SSR, that's just a mode of its template resolver. And that's our server-side render story, because we want to make sure always that rather than making an assumption that the origin server is just going to do server-side render, having that be implicit, we want it to be explicit. We want the progressive web app, which is a client-side rendered app, to be able to state in its configuration files 
how the server side render is supposed to work. Uh, and then when it moves around to different servers, if you try to deploy a PWA that expects React server side render, then the target deployed server can say specifically in its deployment logs, I'm not going to be able to do this or that. And a lot more informative error messaging. So we've talked about this because at the end of the day, I've just spewed a lot of technical garbage, but people want SSR for search engine optimization and marketing optimization. And it's, it's not as easy to do server-side rendering on a React app as some other apps. It's an ongoing question, but we want to continue making that better. We have some early ideas about pre-rendering a lot of your landing pages, which is something that projects like Gatsby.js do. Um, the React team is going to add um, better server-side rendering for the asynchronous systems that we use for progressive load, like React Suspense and Dynamic Imports. Um, so I think we we will we have no rule against adding React SSR systems inside the Venia concept, but we don't want them to be absolutely required. We would call it say a progressive enhancement, um, and that's our policy. That's our story with server side render. Um, it's open to review. It's open to discussion and challenge as always, and we've gotten some interesting challenges about it. Um, but we we are committed to making sure that this whole technology stack is available for all. Um, so that's the SSR thing, and that's just kind of my my five minutes on it. And the other question is about GraphQL queries. Where, uh, hey, hey, James, before you move on to that, can I ask a question? Dave Usselton. Hey. Oh, sure. Hey, Dave. Hey. Um, so real briefly, or if this is a side conversation, tell me if it's a side conversation. What do you think? Server side rendering offers as advantages over client side rendering for marketing. Um, so when I say marketing, um, I'm talking about the term SMO, social marketing, social media. Um, okay. So SEO and SMO are dependent on the uh, outer systems that are doing the inspection. Like that's why everyone's always doing this criminology and like guessing whether Google is really rendering your whole page and are they doing it and is Yandex right. doing it. You know, so for SEO, it's like, let's just make sure that this page tells Google or whoever else is the authority on its relevance, like what it has in it, uh, you know, metadata schema, this is a product that can be bought. Um, and that's a moving target, um, but obviously you need to do some manner of server-side render and the recommendations from Google and everyone else keep changing, yay. But then SMO, like for marketing, is another slightly simpler subject. When you take a link from a store and you paste it into Slack or Facebook or an iMessage, then the link in these modern systems, it hydrates. It comes uh, alive and it has a media. It has a little like media object with the, the picture of the product and then the title and maybe the beginning of the description. And if you're lucky, some actions to take. So that's the media object concept in social media that in Facebook, for instance, relies on open graph. And that also, I mean, those systems definitely don't hydrate your whole page. That's just Slack is looking at the HTML. So right, right. that's another reason to have enough SSR to populate those objects. So it is mostly social, social media marketing that you're talking about when you say that. Yeah, which is, now I'm not in the business, but as I understand it today, most marketing. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So we'll leave the, you, as you know, I have my nose way in the Adobe stuff too. So maybe we'll take that sure, offline sure. to talk about that, how it impacts target and things like that. Because I think from that perspective, they would want to see it be server side, right? Yeah, and I'm being cheeky about most marketing. Yeah, I mean, SEO and SMO is like, it's the phrase that we use to roll up our general obligation for many reasons to do server right. side rendering of, of the entity that's, that the page represents. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ben. Sorry to disrupt. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Um, I guess the other thing is GraphQL queries, uh, for which I wish Jimmy was here because he's the guardian of that idea and that best practice. Um, but I understand it and I can represent his point of view. Um, so we have GraphQL queries in separate files in our project, though not all of them. There are still files that um, can include GraphQL queries constructed inline via the GQL tag. And it's easy to think 
that it's good to encapsulate. It's good to have them be separate files. It allows for code reuse. And that is indeed our thinking. Um, Upward can read GraphQL files. So when they're separate files, you can use the same get product detail query in Upward to resolve the and preload the data that the product's root component page also needs. So you can do server side and client side load through the same code path. And that's nice. That's code reuse. But part of GraphQL and part of what makes it such a better experience for client side um, development and for front end development is that you can specifically write a query for the component that you're making. If you're making a little tile that renders a product image and the title, a short description, and a price, under a REST system, you have to get the whole product. You have to describe that it needs the whole product, and that might be like a you know 40 kilobyte J JSON entity. And in GraphQL, the idea is that right in line with writing the React itself, you just open a little string literal to GraphQL, you type a query with three things in it. And so the principle is that GraphQL queries are a part of component declaration. That the flexibility of GraphQL is designed so that uh, you can tune a query for your particular view's needs. And that's an important thing for us to respect. So we want to allow for that. We um, we want to clarify that our best practice does not demand that every GraphQL query is a separate document or a separate file. In fact, we are interested in future optimizations where, for instance, during the Webpack build, um, we could identify inline GraphQL queries done with the GraphQL template uh, literal and uh, extract them into files for things like upward reuse. But the point is that it's it's important for us to remember that GraphQL is most importantly for the convenience of the developer tying their specific visual view implementation to data. So that's something we don't want to lose sight of. And that's a summary of that discussion. Um, are, are there others that I have missed or that um, we need to talk about? I know like at least one thing, we have five more minutes that the mm -hmm. Docker Compose solution that Caden's been working on is really exciting. Um, I don't know if you're prepared to talk about it, but it's another thing that I think is cool to discuss. Um, yeah, I mean, it's still a work in progress right now. It's um, in PR, so people can check it out if you want to. And yeah, so right now I just got something up to have it also support Windows, but I wasn't able to get the automation with Windows for the CERT and the SSL. Um, so if anybody is a Windows automation with certs and SSL guru out there, happy to see any kind of comments on my pull request. But otherwise, um, there are manual instructions. It's still in the script um, to set up, so you don't have to run anything extra. It'll just tell you exactly everything you need to do. Pretty pretty easy. But yeah, happy to see any um, comments on my pull request if you have any thoughts or ideas. All right. Yeah, I don't think there was anything else uh, specifically, James. Uh, so maybe just uh, with the last couple of minutes here, if there are any other op open questions based on uh, this recent discussion, right, uh, feel free to chime in here either on the chat or on video, audio. Okay, cool. So uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up here. Um, if there is, if there's anything else, feel free to uh, to to hit the team on the community Slack channel. Uh, we'll post the video for viewing later, sharing later. And uh, thanks everybody, and have a have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.